Where the Red Fern Grows, Chapter 18 Just before dawn, the storm blew itself out with one last angry roar. It started snowing. A frozen silence settled over the cane break. Back in the thick timber of the river bottoms, the sharp snapping of frozen limbs could be heard. The tall stalks of wild cane looked exhausted from the hellish night. They were drooping and bending from the weight of frozen sleet. I climbed out of the deep gully and listened for my dogs. I couldn't hear them. Just as I started back down the bank, I heard something. I listened. Again, I heard the sound. Papa was watching me. Can you hear the dogs, he asked. No, not the dogs, I said, but I, I can hear something else. What does it sound like, he asked. Like someone whooping, I said. Papa and the judge hurried up the bank. We heard the sound again. It was coming from a different direction. The first time I heard it, I said it was over that way. That's the men from the camp, the judge said. They're searching for us. We started whooping. The searchers answered. Their voices came from all directions. The first one to reach us was Mr. Kyle. He looked haggard and tired. He asked if everything was all right. Yes, we're all right, Papa said, but the old man had a bad ankle. Looks like we'll have to carry him out. Your team broke loose and come back to camp about midnight, Mr. Kyle said. This really spooked us. We were sure something bad had happened. Twenty-five of us have been searching since then. Several men climbed down the bank and went over to Grandpa. They looked at his ankle. One said, I don't think it's broken, but it sure is a bad sprain. You're in luck, another one said. We have one of the best doctors in the state of Texas in our camp, Dr. Charlie Latham. He'll have you fixed up in no time. Yes, another said, and if I know Charlie, he's probably got a small hospital with him. Back in the crowd, I heard another man say, you mean that Latham fellow who owns those black and tan hounds is a doctor? Sure is, another said, one of the best. Mr. Kyle asked where my dogs were. I told him that they were treed somewhere. What do you mean, treed somewhere, he asked. Papa explained what had happened. With a wide-eyed look on his face, he said, Do you mean to tell me those hounds stayed with the tree in that blizzard? I nodded. Looking at me, he said, Son, I hope they have that coon treed because you need that one to win the cup. Those two walker hounds caught three before the storm came up. When it got bad, all the hunters came in. The judge spoke up. I'll always believe that those hounds knew that boy needed another coon to win, he said. If you fellows had seen some of the things those dogs have done, you'd believe it too. One hunter walked over to the broken snag. Three out of one tree, he said. No wonder. Look here. The old snag was half full of leaves and grass. Why, it was a regular old den tree. Several of the men walked over. I heard one say, I've seen this happen before. Remember that big hunt in the Red River Bottoms when the two little beagle hounds treed four coons in one old hollow snag? They won the championship too. I wasn't there, but I remember reading about it, one said. Say, I don't see Benson, Mr. Kyle said. The men started looking at each other. He was searching farther down river than the rest of us, one fellow said. Maybe he didn't hear us shouting. Some of the men climbed out of the gully. They started whooping. From a distance, we heard an answering shout. He hears us, someone said. He's coming. Everyone looked relieved. Mr. Benson struck the washout a little way above us. He was breathing hard as if he'd been running. He started talking as soon as he was within hearing distance. It scared me when I first saw them, he said. I didn't know what they were. They looked like white ghosts. I'd never seen anything like it. A hunter grabbed Mr. Benson by the shoulder, shaking him. Get a hold of yourself, man, he said. What are you talking about? Mr. Benson took a deep breath to control himself and started again in a much calmer voice. Those two hounds, he said, I found them. They're frozen solid. They're nothing but white ice from the tips of their nose to the ends of their tails. Hearing Mr. Benson's words, I screamed and ran to my father. Everything started whirling round and round. I felt light as a feather. My knees buckled. I knew no more. Regaining consciousness, I opened my eyes and could dimly see the blurry images of men around me. 
A hand was shaking me. I could hear my father's voice, but I couldn't understand his words. Little by little, the blackness faded away. My throat was dry and I was terribly thirsty. I asked for some water. Mr. Benson came over. He said, son, I'm sorry, truly sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Your dogs are alive. I guess I was excited. I'm very sorry. I heard a deep voice say, that's a hell of a thing to do. Come running in here saying those dogs are frozen solid. Mr. Benson said, I didn't mean it to sound that way. I said, I'm sorry. What more do you want me to do? The deep voice growled again. I think it was a hell of a thing for a man to do. Mr. Kyle looked over. Now, let's not have any more of this, he said. We have work to do. We've been standing here acting like a bunch of school kids. All this time, that old man has been lying there suffering. A couple of you men cut two poles and make a stretcher to carry him. While the men were getting the poles, Papa heated the coonskins again and rewrapped Grandpa's foot. With belts and long leather laces from their boots, the hunters made a stretcher. Very gently, they put Grandpa on it. Again, Mr. Kyle took command. Part of us will start for camp with him, he said. The others will go after the dogs. Here, take this gun, Papa said. I'll go with him. Looking at me, Mr. Kyle said, Come on, son. I want to see your hounds. Mr. Benson led the way. As soon as we get out of this cane, he said, we may be able to hear them. They have that coon treed in a big black gum tree. You're going to see a sight. Now, I mean a sight. They've walked a ring around that tree, clear down through the ice and snow. You can see the bare ground. Wonder why they did that, someone asked. I don't know, Mr. Benson replied, unless they ran in that circle to keep from freezing to death or to keep the coon in the tree. I figure I knew why my dogs were covered with ice. The coon had probably crossed the river maybe several times. Old Dan and little Ann would have followed him. They'd come out of the river with their coats dripping wet, and the freezing blast of the blizzard had done the rest. Nearing the tree, we stopped and stared. Did you ever see anything like that? Mr. Benson asked. When I first saw them, I thought they were white wolves. My dogs hadn't seen us when we came up. They were trotting round and round. Just as Mr. Benson had said, we could see the path they'd worn down through the ice and snow till the bare black earth was visible. Like ghostly white shadows around and around they trotted. In a low voice, someone said, they know that if they stop, they'll freeze to death. It's unbelievable, said Mr. Kyle. Come on, we must do something quick. With a choking sob, I ran for my dogs. On hearing our approach, they sat down and started bawling treed. I noticed their voices didn't have that solid ring. Their ice-covered tails made a rattling sound as they switched this way and that on the icing ground. A large fire was built. Standing my dogs close to the warm heat, the gentle hands of the hunters went to work. With handkerchiefs and scarves, heated steaming hot, little by little, the ice was thawed from their bodies. If they'd ever lain down, someone said, they would have frozen to death. They knew it, another said. That's why they kept running in that circle. What I can't understand is why they stayed with the tree, Mr. Benson said. I've seen hounds stay with a tree for a while, but not in a northern blizzard. Men, said Mr. Kyle, people have been trying to understand dogs ever since the beginning of time. One never knows what they'll do. You can read every day where a dog saved the life of a drowning child or lay down his life for his master. Some people call this loyalty. I don't. I may be wrong, but I call it love. The deepest kind of love. After these words were spoken, a thoughtful silence settled over the men. The mood was broken by the deep, growling voice I'd heard back in the washout. It's a shame that people all over the world can't have that kind of love in their hearts, he said. There'd be no wars, slaughter, or murder, no greed or selfishness. It would be the kind of world that God wants us to have, a wonderful world. After all the ice was thawed from my dogs and their coats were dried out, I could see they were all right. I was happy again and felt good all over. One of the hunters said, do you think those hounds are thawed out enough to fight a coon? Sure, just run him out of the tree, I said. At the crack of the gun, the coon ran far out on a big limb and stopped. Again, the hunter sprinkled him with birdshot. This time, he jumped. 
Hitting the ground, he crouched down. Old Dan made a lunge. Just as he reached him, the coon sprang straight up and came down on his head. Holding on with his claws, the coon sank his teeth in a long, tender ear. Old Dan was furious. He started turning in a circle, bawling with pain. Little Ann was trying hard to get a hold of the coon, but she couldn't. Because of his fast circling, old Dan's feet flew out from under him and he fell. This gave little Ann a chance. Darting in, her jaws closed on the back of the coon's neck. I knew the fight was over. Arriving back at camp, I saw that all the tents had been taken down but ours. The hunter said, everyone was in a hurry to get out before another blizzard sets in. Papa told me to take my dogs into the tent as Grandpa wanted to see them. I saw tears in my grandfather's eyes as he talked to them. His ankle was wrapped in bandages. His foot and toes were swollen to twice their normal size. They turned a greenish yellow color. Placing my hand on his foot, I could feel the feverish heat. Dr. Latham came over. Are you ready to go now, he asked. Snorting and growling, Grandpa said, I told you I wasn't going anywhere till I see the gold cup handed to this boy. Turning to face the crowd, Dr. Latham said, Men, let's get this over. I want to get this man to town. That's one of the meanest sprains I've ever seen, and it should be in a cast, but I don't have any plaster of Paris with me. The hunter who had come by our tent collecting the jackpot money came over to me. He handed me the box. He said, Here you are, son. There's over $300 in this box. It's all yours. Turning to the crowd, he said, Fellas, I can always say this. On this hunt, I've seen two of the finest little coon hounds I ever hoped to see. There was a roar of approval from the crowd. Looking down, I saw the box was almost full of money. I was shaking all over. I tried to say thanks, but it was only a whisper. Turning, I handed the box to my father. As his rough old hands closed around it, I saw a strange look over his face. He turned and looked at my dogs. Some of the men started shouting, Here it is! The crowd parted and the judge walked through. I saw the gleaming metal of the gold cup in his hand. After a short speech, he handed it to me saying, Son, this makes me very proud. It's a great honor to present you with this championship cup. The crowd exploded. The hunter's shouts were deafening. I don't know from where the two silly old tears came. They just squeezed their way out. I felt them as they rolled down my cheeks. One dropped on the smooth surface of the cup and splattered. I wiped it away with my sleeve. Turning to my dogs, I knelt down and showed the cup to them. Little Ann licked it. Old Dan sniffed one time and then turned his head away. The judge said, son, there's a place on the cup to engrave the names of your dogs. I can take it into Oklahoma City and have it done, or you can have it done yourself. The engraving charge has already been paid by the association. Looking at the cup, it seemed that far down in the gleaming shadows, I could see two wide blue eyes glued to the window pane. I knew that my little sister was watching the road and waiting for our return. Looking back at the judge, I said, if you don't mind, I'll take it with me. My grandfather can send it in for me. Laughing, he said, that's all right. Handing me a slip of paper, he said, this is the address where you should send it. Grandpa said, now that that's settled, I'm ready to go to town. Turning to Papa, he said, you'll have to bring the buggy, and I wish you'd look after my stock. I know Grandma will want to go in with us, and there'll be no one there to feed them. Tell Bill Lowry to come up and take care of the store. You'll find the keys in the usual place. We'll take care of everything, Papa said. Don't worry about a thing. I don't intend to stop till we get back, because it looks like we're in for some more bad weather. I went over and kissed Grandpa goodbye. He pinched my cheeks and whispered, We'll teach these city slickers that they can't come here and beat our dogs. I smiled. Grandpa was carried out and made comfortable in the back seat of Dr. Latham's car. I stood and watched as it wheezed and bounced its way out of sight. While I'm harnessing the team, Papa said, You take the tent down and pack our gear. On the back seat of the buggy, I made a box out of our bedclothes. 
Down on the floorboards, I fixed a nice place for my dogs. All through the night, the creaking wheels of our buggy moved on. Several times I woke up. My father had wrapped a tarp around himself. Reaching down, I could feel my dogs. They were warm and comfortable. Early the next morning, we stopped for breakfast. While Papa tended to the team, I turned my dogs loose and let them stretch. We made good time last night, Papa said. If everything goes right, we'll be home long before dark. Reaching Grandpa's store in the middle of the afternoon, Papa said, I'll put the team in the barn and feed the stock while you unload the buggy. Coming back from the barn, he said, in the morning, we'll go over and tell Bill Lowry to come up and open the store. Looking around, he said, it snowed more here than it did where we were hunting. Feeling big and important, I said, I don't like the looks of this weather. We'd better be scooting for home. Papa laughed. Sure you're not in a hurry to get home to show off the gold cup, he asked. A smile was my only answer. 200 yards this side of our home, the road made a turn around a low foothill, shutting our house off from view. Papa said, you're going to see a scramble as soon as we round that bend. It was more of a stampede than a scramble. The little ones came out first and all but tore the screen door from its hinges. The older girls passed her beyond the gate. In a hurry, she slipped and fell face down in the snow. She started crying. The older girls ran up asking for the cup. Holding it high over my head, I said, Now wait a minute. I've got another one for you two. I held the small silver cup out to them. While they were fighting over it, I ran to the little one. Picking her up, I brushed the snow from her long braided hair and her tear-stained face. I told her there was no use to cry. I'd brought the gold cup to her, and no one else was going to get it. Reaching for the cup, she wrapped her small arms around it. Squeezing it tight, she ran for the house to show it to Mama. Mama came out on the porch. She was just as excited as the girls were. She held out her arms. I ran to her. She hugged me and kissed me. It's good to have you home again, she said. Look what I have, Mama, the little one cried. It's all mine. She held the golden cup out in her two small hands. As Mama took the beautiful cup, she looked at me. She started to say something, but was interrupted by the cries from the other girls. We have one too, Mama, they cried, and it's just as pretty as that one. It's not either, the little one piped in a defiant voice. It's not even as big as mine. Two cups, Mama exclaimed. Did you win two? Yes, Mama, I said. Little Ann won that one all by herself. The odd expression on my mother's face was wonderful to see. Holding a cup in each hand, she held them out in front of her. Two, she said, a gold one and a silver one. Who would have thought anything so wonderful could have happened to us? I'm so proud, so very proud. Handing the cups back to the girls, she walked over to Papa. After kissing him, she said, I can't believe anything that has happened. I'm so glad you went along. Did you enjoy yourself? With a smile on his face, Papa almost shouted, Enjoy myself? Why, I never had such a time in my life. His voice trailed off to a low calm. That is, except for one thing. Grandpa had a bad accident. Yes, I know, Mama said. One of Tom Logan's boys was at the store when they arrived. He came by and told us all about it. The doctor said it wasn't as bad as it looked, and he was pretty sure Grandpa would be home in a few days. I was happy to hear this news and could tell by the pleased look on my father's face. He was glad to hear it, too. On entering the house, Papa said, oh, I almost forgot. He handed the box of money to Mama. What's this, she asked. Oh, it's just a little gift from old Dan and little Ann, Papa said. Mama opened the box. I saw the color drain from her face. Her hands started trembling. Turning her back to us, she walked over and set it on the mantel. A peaceful silence settled over the room. I could hear the clock ticking away. The fire in the fireplace crackled and popped. Turning from the mantel, Mama looked straight at us. Her lips were tightly pressed together to keep them from quivering. Walking slowly to Papa, she buried her face in his chest. I heard her say, Thank God, my prayers have been answered. 
There was a celebration in our home that night. To me, it was like a second Christmas. Mama opened a jar of huckleberries and made a large cobbler. Papa went to the smokehouse and came back with a hickory cured ham. We sat down to a feast of ham, huge plates of fried potatoes, ham gravy, hot cornbread, fresh butter, and wild bee honey. During the course of the meal, the entire story of the championship hunt was told, some by Papa, but mostly by me. Just when everything was so perfect and peaceful, an argument sprang up between the two oldest girls. It seemed that each wanted to claim the silver cup. Just when they were on the verge of sawing it in two, so each would have her allotted share, Papa settled the squabble by giving the oldest one a silver dollar. Once again, peace and harmony was restored. That night, as I was preparing for bed, a light flashed by my window. Puzzled, I tiptoed over and peeked through the pane. It was Mama, carrying my lantern and two large plates heaped high with food. She was heading for the doghouse, setting the light down on the ground in front of it. She called to my dogs while they were eating. Mama did something I couldn't understand. She knelt down on her knees in prayer. After they'd eaten their food, Mama started petting them. I could hear her voice, but couldn't make out her words. Whatever she was saying must have pleased them. Little Ann wiggled and twisted. Even old Dan wagged his long red tail, which was very unusual. Papa came out. I saw him put his arm around Mama. Side by side, they stood for several minutes looking at my dogs. When they turned to enter the house, I saw Mama dab at her eyes with her apron. Lying in bed, staring into the darkness, I tried hard to figure out the strange actions of my parents. Why had Mama knelt in prayer in front of my dogs? Why had she wept? I was running all the way around in my mind when I heard them talking. I know, Papa said, but I think there's a way. I'm going to have a talk with Grandpa. I don't think that old foot of his is ever going to be the same again. He's going to need some help around the store. I knew they were talking about me, but I couldn't understand what they meant. Then I thought, why, that's it. They want me to help Grandpa. That would be all right with me. I could still hunt every night. Feeling smart for figuring out the conversation, I turned over and fell asleep.